Good evening. As uh, Alice Cooper once said, welcome to my nightmare. Uh, you probably hadn't noticed this, but we had a full-blown sewer break in the building. Yeah. And uh, we're not remodeling. We're <laughs> trying to recover. <clears throat> it's been absolutely awful. Uh, worst thing that's ever happened to me. This has been the pits. And uh, the good Lord's moved in. The money's coming in, no problem. These workers are doing great. Kelly and Rick were fantastic. On and on it went. I knew he'd take care of it. Yeah. But it is a major league disaster. The whole cast iron pipe under the building just snapped. No bathrooms, which reminds me. If you need to go to the bathroom, you go across the lot here to the healing house. There's two bathrooms over there, okay? And uh, Crystal's over there, so she'll let you in. The door has an automatic lock on it. No problem, okay? So these bathrooms obviously are not working. And thank you so much to our friends on YouTube and you folks for sending in the donations to pay for this mess. It's like, it's up to 28 grand, I think, was the current total, but it'll probably go a little higher. But doesn't matter. Uh, Thus saith the Lord, the cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Yeah. The Holy Ghost has no problems with money. Okay. If I run out of money, it's no problem. He's loaded. Loaded with everything. Deliverances, the healing, the money, everything. He's got everything. All right. Let's get on to our Bible study, Bad Boys, tonight. <clears throat> the next seminar, December 29th, uh, The Invisible World, Part 2. Here's our YouTube channel. Uh, our, thank God our PowerPoint hasn't collapsed. Um, all our teachings are on our YouTube site, youtube.com slash houseofhealingaz. Go there and catch anything you want. If you want to switch over from Google to Good Search and put in our charity name, that would be great because they'll pay us when you surf the uh, internet. Thank you. <clears throat> Here's the most important thing in the world, the miracle list. If you're looking for your destiny, you can find it here. I send out maybe a dozen or so of these a week. So if I can get them to do it, miracles happen. If not, I'll send it to him again. Don't forget our, our monthly prayer meeting with the Carters. And uh, it's the fourth Saturday of every month in the Healing House next door at 11 o'clock. Please come pray for the ministry. This month, please mention plumbing issues. Don't forget about my deliverance training class. It is right after the prayer meeting, the fourth Saturday of every month at noon in the small sanctuary. If you ever have any interest in going to the deliverance ministry, here's uh, 18 classes that will save you a lot of work and a lot of frustration over the years. That's in the bookstore. The bookstore is closed. There's seven churches of Revelation. If you want to know what's going on right now, that's in the bookstore. The bookstore's closed. Don't forget about our super Zoom service every week. Wednesday night, Rick and Stephanie. It's the bomb. Six o'clock. Send me an email, Mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I'll send you the code and the password. Don't, ladies, don't forget about your Zoom every week. This one is fantastic. Mondays at 6.30 p.m. Arizona time. Just send me an email and I'll send you the information. Ladies, there's a seminar for you in January, okay? Can you believe we're on, on January of 2024 already? That's shocking. I told the Lord I can only take one plumbing issue per decade. <laughs> you can download our app if you want to donate to us. Thank you. Right now, i got to be honest with you, the money's going toward all this crap, so... Sorry about that. Today's 
donation boxes are on the doors if you'd like to donate here tonight that'd be great you can donate on the website on PayPal thank you and you can uh, check out all my old radio programs I've been on the radio for over 20 years here in the valley on 1010 a.m. just go to the home page of the website hit the media button then hit the streaming radio shows and you're there I'm on live uh, every Monday through Friday at 7 30 in the morning on the radio on 10 10 a.m. and I'm on Saturday and Sunday afternoon I'm also on 1100 a.m. conservative talk radio every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock then at 9 o'clock is my podcast twitch.tv just put in the code HCCADC or you can go watch it on Facebook Michael W. Smith YouTubers, please remember to set up an ambush team in your church. All you need is two or three saints. You go on scout every Sunday morning. You look around. You start picking off the sick people. You investigate them. And then you take them aside and you pray for them. They get delivered or healed. And then they tell somebody about it, and then pretty soon they're lining up to get to you. That'll go on for a couple of months, and then you'll get the X. You'll get thrown out of your church, but that's okay. That's a promotion. Getting thrown out is a promotion. If you got fired at your job, time for praise. That means God's got a better job for you somewhere else okay if you get fired or thrown out of your church and you start griping moaning complaining and murmuring about it you're done <clears throat> these three books I wrote one on Satan one on ministering the mentally ill and one on divine healing in the bookstore which is closed <laughs> these platforms uh, carry our broadcast here Thursday nights with brother Rick and Friday nights they're all on here and uh, these platforms also carry our broadcasts again thank you to Kelly rumble is doing well for us there's the code HOHHCC and I'll see you in California for Christmas for a deliverance training seminar in Carlsbad Carlsbad okay I'll see you there on the 23rd of December. Oh man. Bad boys. Let's take a look at it, shall we? <clears throat> you know, years ago, when you was born, you were born into a some kind of a family, right? And every one of us are the product of our environment. And we are the product of our family. And adopted family, birth family, could be anything. And then after that, we're the product of our school years. Right? So if you add uh, your family life with grade school and you put them together, you pretty much got the person and that's kind of you huh? and the devil attacks the kids more than anybody because they're very impressionable they're defenseless and they are almost like supernatural learners children are like human sponges they just absorb everything in their environment they learn much quicker than adults you know if you take a bunch of Irish kids and drop them in Tijuana within three days they're fluent in Spanish it's nuts if you put me there I would get Como at one week and then a sta the next week <laughs> children are like human sponges they absorb everything in their environment mentally physically and emotionally and spiritually and the demons know once they get the kids, 
than they got the rest of their lives. And because we are having so many dysfunctional families in America, kids are very vulnerable and they have no protection, so the devil just takes pot shots at them and he's got them. And the Jews, when they came out of Egypt, had to be deprogrammed. They had been there for 270 or 280 something years. And uh, they were essentially raised in Egypt. And they had to be deprogrammed, you know, almost like somebody who's been in a cult. And the parents hire deprogrammers to kidnap them. It takes uh, about a, two months to deprogram somebody out of a cult. It's all mental. If I don't do any deprogramming here. I do regular counseling. I don't do deprogramming. <clears throat> but God does do deprogramming, and he had to do that to the Jews. They had to be deprogrammed because they were essentially Egypt. And we saw it manifest with Aaron with the golden calf. Moses was late coming home, and the Jews mentally went back to Egypt. Yeah. And today, it's exactly the same. If you do not change how you think, you will go back to the way you were raised to think. So after you become a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit's trying to deprogram you, so to speak, and trying to get you to think and act like Christ. Well, that should be pretty easy for him to do. It is not easy at all. Okay? It is extremely difficult because the Holy Spirit has limitations on his power. Self-imposed limitations. Okay. He has unlimited power, but it's controlled based on human free will. God's mighty power is based on human free will. These people over here who have all kinds of spiritual gifts think differently than these Christians over here who have nothing. They've been saved for 20 years. They have no gifts, no power, no nothing. They've been saved for 30 years. These people over here, and they're a much smaller group, have wonderful gifts and miracles and but these people think differently than those. Their free will is different than those. So God doesn't move here. He does move here based on God happens to be having a good day today and not, no. Jehovah is the same day in and day out. Thus saith the Lord, I change not. Hello? Yeah, it's, it's the human driving the car. It's the gas pedal. Some people drive fast, some people are slow pokes. And it's the same spiritually. You are blessed by God to live in as much misery as you choose. My gosh, Brother Mike, he's, he's like Warren Buffett. Whatever you choose in your Christian life is exactly what you get. You can whine about it, you can gripe about it, you can... Do whatever you want about it, but if you can live with it, you got to keep it. At every service, right here, demons flying out of all these people 
in the back, somebody sitting there watching. Hmm. Okay. These people, free will, is different than somebody sitting in the back hmm, watching. So the Holy Ghost doesn't go back there. He comes up here. What's he looking for? Somebody with... Positive free will. That's what he's looking for. Right? Yeah, that, that's, you know, to, to make money in Christianity, you've got to complicate everything, see? And you've got to give the idiot Christian a sense that they're discovering something. Here's a new book. Here's a new concept I never heard before. I'm going to go to the courts of heaven. And I'm going to print that in my cave book. Stupid. If you've ever heard that saying, keep it simple, stupid. Oh, it applies in Christianity more than it applies anywhere. The simpler it is, the more powerful it is. It's what Paul called the simplicity of Christ. Somebody sent me a long video recently on the tribulation. I had taught on the tribulation. I said, I, I said to everybody, I'm not sure when the tribulation is going to start or when the rapture is going to hit. But I'm kind of leaning toward pre-trib. Well, they heard that. I didn't say it was pre-trib. I said I was leaning toward pre-trib. See, I didn't hit you, but I just am leaning toward hitting you. See, there's the difference between hitting someone and leaning toward hitting them. See that? See that maneuver there? Like a gymnast. Well, they sent me this one long dissertation about this guy's theory that it was uh, post trip, you know, and I did, looked at it and said, That's interesting, deleted it, and said, Hey, the rapture is going to happen sooner or later. Who cares? <laughs> See how simple I kept that? Because I have no control over the rapture. See, I can only control what I can control. And the only thing a human being can totally control, as you well know, 100% is your mind. God gave you 100% total control over your mind. You, have, you do not have control, total control, 100% over anything else in this world. Doesn't matter what it is. The weather, your spouse. Uh, well, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> your kids. Anything on this planet. You, you do not have 100% control over it anything on this planet except your mind. And how you were raised, how you were raised is a pretty good indicator of how you're going to be as an adult. Did you know that? Okay. I'll try and prove it to you. Okay, now, Jehovah in Leviticus 6, his deprogramming was uh, well underway now, and God would accept offerings from the Jews, and God would set it to fire. It was supernatural, the fire of God, right? Remember that? And it burned 24-7. Jehovah's fire at the altar burned 24-7 for the Jews, right? And Moses... Uh, told Aaron and his sons that they were to be minister of the office of the high priest of Israel. And he gave them special clothing, Leviticus chapter 8. And uh, Moses said, listen, this is what you will say to the people of Israel. Numbers chapter 6. It says, you speak these words to them during the offering period and 
when the fire of God burns up the altering, you will say this to them, the Lord keep you and help bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance on you and give you peace. There you go. That was the high priest creed. They would go through the ceremony. And at the end of the ceremony, Aaron or his sons would give that blessing to the people and bless the Jews. Right? Okay. Leviticus 9. <clears throat> fire would come out from God. This was supernatural fire. And it would burn up the offering if it was accepted. And it would burn everything up. Remember? The great story of Elijah, so to speak. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Why? Because it was supernatural. The supernatural fire. And then, Aaron's two sons, um, you know, <clears throat> when you live in a family of privilege, many times that privilege or that concept of being privilege kind of rubs off on the kids. So, when your dad or mom is up here, you're up here too. And then everybody else's dad and mom's down here, and their kids are down here. Right? Most people are not raised in privilege, but uh, Nadab and Abihu, uh, in spite of their names, were, <laughs> were raised in privilege. They were in the office of the highest office in Israel, the high priest office. They were at the top. They were the kids that went to school by limousines. These were the Silicon Valley kids. These, these were the rich kids. They had everything in life. And it went to their heads, and they started to develop a kind of an attitude that, hey, I'm, I'm kind of an elevated person, and people who have an elevated view of themselves have a sense that the rules don't apply to them. They have this sense in their soul. They may not say it, but there's kind of a sense in there that, you know, I'm kind of above, the, I mean, these people abide by the rules, but I, I don't have to abide by the rules, see? When, when you're a privileged person, you don't have to abide by traffic laws. Right? So if you're a famous person, you're speeding, the cop pulls you over. Instead of getting a ticket, you give him an autograph. But a regular person that gets pulled over gets a ticket. Well, these two sons let this thing go to their heads, and they wanted to experiment with this offering stuff. So they created their own fire. Zur is the Hebrew word. It was a foreign fire. It wasn't a supernatural fire of God. And boom, God's judgment, Leviticus 10, fell on these two boys and did what? Burned them up. Okay? Burned them up. Ed's barbecue. Boom. Gone. And of course, Aaron was in a state of shock over it. And he was deeply hurt over it, okay? And the problem was Aaron. See, it's not the kid. Almost most of the time, it's, it's the parent. They let, Aaron let them live in privilege, and he let them develop a mindset of being special. And it got him killed. Any parent who gives their child too much later in life deeply regrets it. They live in sorrow and sadness and misery. The kids who were given too much also live in misery. Because in the real world, people don't want to give you too much. They want you to give stuff to them. And that doesn't mesh with the way you were raised. 
Aaron was behind this execution. And then Moses came along doing the right thing and said, hey, you knew what was going to happen because you heard the word of the Lord. And it happened. You violated it. And Aaron realized he was wrong and said nothing. Then Moses, to pound this story in, takes Aaron's other two sons, right? Who later became high priests. And they came and got the bodies that were cooked. Why did he do that? Why didn't they have servants do it? Because Moses wanted those two to understand what had happened to the other two brothers and why they had a privileged mindset that was a delusion and they assumed it transferred to Jehovah when it didn't. That's the way Christians are today. They assume they can kind of live on the fence of sin here and kind of just kind of not get over there, but and they think they can get away with it. And Moses had him take them out of the camp and bury them. Then Moses said something shocking. You're not even allowed to mourn for these two dead sons. Because if you mourn for them, that's telling God you didn't agree with what he did. And the incident happened because they didn't agree with what God told them. Wasn't even allowed to have a funeral. They took them out and buried them like a dead dog. What would have happened to you this week had the blood of Jesus not been around? You would be dead. Brother Mike, you're not a nice person. I'm an extremely nice person. <laughs> Everyone who knows me just loves me. Not when you violate the law of God, if it wasn't for the blood of Christ, you'd be cooked. You live in the dispensation of grace. Nabib and Ibugu. No. 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 If you just read that quickly, you just say to yourself, well, they kind of deserved it with names like that. But no, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story was they knew what God wanted, but because they had a privileged attitude, they lost their lives. If you think you have a privileged attitude putzing around with sin, you will eventually lose your life. Hello? The soul that sinneth it shall die. Do not wail for their deaths. Aaron, let's switch over to another interesting family. Remember him? Eli, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Well, Eli was very old, and uh, he heard all the things his sons did in Israel. What happened was they were like Eli, he was the high priest of Israel and a judge of Israel. And Eli was a great man of God. He did an excellent job serving God. Uh, almost everything in the Bible is positive about him. He was a good minister of God. He was a faithful servant. Been there for 40 years. Never wavered. But, oh, but, he had the Aaron syndrome. His sons, he loved his sons too much. Oh, you can't love anybody too much, Brother Mike. Well, you probably can't, but if it allows you to not discipline them, your love is actually a form of hate.
Did I just say that? I think I did. If your love for someone is so high that you can't discipline them, you're li actually hating them. Eli was a wonderful man of God. 40 year reign, super job, but oh man, the devil had one hook in him. One hook. His boys, his sons. Oh, he loved his sons. He loved them. He loved them too much. Well, the boys had the privileged attitude. They say, hey, you know what? We're running the tabernacle here. We, we're in charge of the worship. You see, in, in American society, in the United States, you can be sued if you are in a school or a business or something and you use your position of authority to manipulate someone into sexual behavior. Correct? If you use your position of authority to take advantage of someone sexually, you can get sued for that. Correct? That happens all the time. That's what they were doing. Hey, we're, we're the boss. We have authority. And these women are coming to worship. And hey, I'll tap into whoever I want. And they would submit. Why? Because they had special privileges. They had special powers given to them by the great man of God, Eli. But Eli gave his sons, oh, a cancer. You know what a parent is that doesn't discipline their kids? They're cancer spreaders. They spread the cancer to the kids. And the kids die ugly, thinking they're special and privileged, when in fact they're not. It's an illusion. It's a delusion. They took advantage of the women. They were tapping into the girls, and Samuel called them on it finally. Must have gone on for years. Why are you doing this? You know, you're doing evil things to the people. They're complaining to me about it. Hey, Eli, your sons are taking advantage of the women. They're doing this. They're probably doing a bunch of other stuff. Why? Because in their minds, they thought they were superior to these other people. They thought they had a privileged status. He says, my sons, you're not supposed to do this. Stop it. You know, verse down in chapter 2. Remember the story? You're causing the people of God to transgress. You know, I'm using my authority over, over you, and you are submitting sexually to me, so you're committing adultery by submitting. But the person has to submit because the other person is dominating them. They have the money, the power, the authority, You'll get fired, you're what, what have you. So they submit. So they're sinning. And they're making a mockery out of the worship of God and the, the temple of God. They're making a mockery out of it. So what they were doing was extremely sinful. And uh, Samuel's warning them, you're sinning against God. He's telling his sons, you're sinning against God. I'm the high priest of Israel. I'm the boss. I'm in charge. But my sons have got me. They got a hook in me. They got a hook. I am a, a cowardly, gutless codependent. And they hearken not to the voice of their father. They didn't listen to him. They ignored him. Could they get away with that? Yes. Why? Because if you don't discipline your children, you're helping to kill them. 
You're turning him into a loser or you're turning him into a failure. Aaron did it to his sons. Eli looks like he's doing it to his sons. He doesn't do anything but Eli's sons were like these guys. Here, here's textbook examples of privileged, wealthy men taking advantage of women. Here's a textbook example. A priest is in a position of honor and respect, dominating and taking advantage of children sexually. Why? Because they're in a position of authority. The church has given them authority, therefore they have authority. They are in a position of power, able to excommunicate and so on. So they sexually molest kids and nobody says anything about it. Nobody stops it. Correct? And God sent Eli a prophet, and the guy doesn't even have a name. There's an apostle prophet moving, sweeping, movement sweeping through the United States and the churches. It's embarrassing. Oh, oh my God, it's embarrassing. It's like, it's like mass hemorrhoid infestation. Nowadays, if you don't have apostle or prophet after your name, you can't sell any books or CDs. <clears throat> this guy here, his name wasn't even put in the Bible. And this guy, unlike the prophets nowadays, was a legitimate prophet of God and actually heard from God instead of giving people spiritual impressions. Here it is. He comes to Eli and says, hey, we got a problem here. Dad, you, this is permissive parenting. And God says, look, didn't I take the people out of Egypt? Didn't I take care of you? Didn't I give you the priesthood? Didn't you come down from, from Aaron? And aren't you the son of Aaron's fourth son? Aren't you direct line of this incredible, miraculous system I set up, the high priest of the nation of Israel? And God says, didn't I choose you to be a priest? Didn't I choose them? Didn't I give you... This office and special privileges? Didn't I do that to your father? Didn't I take care of you with the offerings? Everything you needed was taken care of. God said, thus saith the Lord, I took care of everything you had. Right? I gave you everything. <clears throat> Why are you kicking me in the face? Why are you trashing my sacrifice? Why are you doing this to me? Now notice here that he's talking to Eli, not his two sons, Eli and Phineas. Remember that? You, you see that? The parent is at fault. If you raise your kids and you do not discipline your children, you are at fault for their lives. It's your sin. Why are you letting your honoring your sons above me? God was here, and Aaron's son said, You know what? We got some fire too. Oops. God was here, and Eli put his sons above the Lord. Textbook codependency. Wow. You would have thought the prophet would have gone to Hopney and Phineas, right? No. He went to the root source of the problem. The parent. You're putting your sons above me. They make themselves fat. They're skimming the offerings. Hopney and Phineas could have been TV preachers. 
they would have done real well. Verse Samuel 2, the Lord God of Israel says, I said indeed your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever, but now I'm revoking it. Now the Lord says, be it far from me. Did you know that still applies? You remember when you were young and you had a call of God on your life? That call is conditional. You know what it's conditioned on? Your free will and you answering it. If you don't do it, God is no longer obligated to keep his promise. The picture's not in the hall now, but years ago, I helped start an Assembly of God church in uh, Ghana. Small church, you know, about 40 people, something like that. And uh, I paid for the minister's uh, education at Assembly of God school, paid off his tuition for him. Helped him set up the church, pay, paid for a lot of the bills. Whole thing going great. For years it went great. I went over there myself and preached in that little church and had a deliverance service. It was fantastic. I think it was in uh, 2000 and 2008, I think it was, something like that. I went over there. Well, anyway, uh, to shorten the story up, <clears throat> I would send monthly donations to the church so they could help pay their bills. And this went on for years. I get a, I get a uh, uh, email or a Facebook message from a woman who was asking me, I don't remember, even, I don't remember how she even knew me. She, was, she lived in Ghana. She said, do you know of a good church in Ghana? I said, well, actually I do. This church, Rehoboah Assembly of God. I said, I says to her, go over and see the pastor there, Gideon Armach was his name. Go see Gideon. And, and you go to that church. And, you know, I said, send. Happy. I was happy. I was recruiting for my African church. I felt like an African. And nowadays, I guess if I felt like an African, I can identify as one and be one. But years ago, you couldn't do that. Now you can't. I would be Magumba Smith if I chose to, and I could identify to that, but I just chose not to. She sends me a Facebook message back about four or five days later. She said, hey, uh, I talked to that pastor, Gideon. Oh, you did? Oh, good. Uh, are, is Jehovah and Allah the same? I said, I picked my computer chair up, got back in my seat. I said, what in God's name did you just ask me? Yeah, they, they believe that Allah and Jehovah are, are the same. I take a copy of it. I send it to Gideon. He won't answer it. I sent it again. He wouldn't answer it. I sent it back to her. I can't get him to answer. Do not go to that church. I'm not going there anymore either. Come to find out the guy moved to Atlanta. And somebody got involved in Chrislam. You've heard of that, right? Chrislam, Jehovah, Allah. Boom. We all serve the same God. It's just different, you know. <laughs> Total insanity. <clears throat> Apostle Paul told everybody who these gods were in these other religions. In 1 Corinthians, he said they were demons. Don't, don't send me an email. I'm quoting him. He's at fault. Yell at him. Well, needless to say, I pulled out of that fast. I just dropped it. I never sent him another nickel. I never contacted him again. That was the end of it for me. I had a nice run, but it was over. 
This is what we're doing here. They were dishonoring. Here's, here's Jehovah, and here is Allah. They're, they're the same. They're at the same level. They're the same divinity. They're the same Oh, that that had my teeth grinding for a minute. I was grinding my teeth at the computer. Then I said, oh, I got to stop doing it. Then I calmed myself down, ministered it out. Okay. The days will come when I will cut off your arm, the arm of your fathers. There won't be anybody around. Not one old man in your family tree is going to survive. This is going to be a sign to you. Both your sons will die in one day. Wow. Who, who killed those sons? Uh, Eli killed them. How do you do that? Mm, permissive parenting. If you don't discipline your children, you're issuing them a death sentence. They will kill themselves or someone else will kill them. And Eli killed both of his sons. Aaron killed both of his. Directly? No. Indirectly. They caused it. They wouldn't do anything about the sin of their sons. And Jehovah then drops in a prophecy of the Lord Jesus here, right? 1 Samuel 2.25, I will raise up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind, and to say the least. And I will build him a sure house, and he will walk before me anointed forever. That's what it says in Hebrews 1, right? Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness. Thou hast hated iniquity. Who's he talking about there? Your Savior. And that's exactly what he did. He will walk before me anointed forever. Hebrews chapter 1. The man said to Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today. Somebody shows up right after the prophet leaves. Some messenger comes up, just like the story of Job. He comes running up and says, hey, Eli, guess what happened? You know the story. The, the Philistines overran the Jews, killing them by the thousands. And Israel fled before the Philistines. Tens of thousands of them died. And it says, your two sons, Hopni and Phinehas, they are dead. And worse than that, the Ark of the Covenant has been taken. They kidnapped it. Eli is more concerned about the Ark than he is his sons. Eli was a good man of God. He was a faithful servant of the Lord, had served him for years. Oh, he should have got a pass then. You don't get a pass with sin, and your kids didn't get a pass when you raised them without any discipline. They turned up pregnant, Drunks and on drugs, unemployed and broke. Why? Because you didn't discipline. Well, Brother Mike, I was raised that way, and that's what happened to me. I know. That's why I'm sharing this. Your parents set you up for failure. Because they didn't discipline you. 
they gave you special privileges. Once you give a kid special privileges, that's when they start to sink. Once you love one kid over another, once you show affection of one over another, you planted the seeds of total destruction. You rotted their lives out. What's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to live in misery. They're going to be failures, and they're going to die early and ugly. Why? Because you were a permissive parent. He falls off the back of his seat. He was fat, remember? He sat by the side of the gate where people come in and out of the city. He broke his neck and died after 40 years of serving the Lord. Wow, what a story. You wouldn't believe how many PKs go bad, right? It's as common as anything. A preacher's kid, I mean, most of them backslide. They, they get special privileges. They're treated differently. They're seen differently by others at the church. Instead of being a normal person, they're the preacher's kid. Right? Happened to Franklin Graham. Yeah, he backslid and left. Billy raised him right, and he was privileged, and he saw all these things that nobody else saw. He got to be a part of all these things nobody else got to be a part of. And he left. He quit. Yeah, and God's answered Billy's prayers and brought him back. Yeah, but he took a terrible beating there for a while. Some kids don't have the kind of prayers following Franklin Graham had. They don't come back. And they die, they overdose, they're in prison, they're in jail. They're in a group home for the mentally ill. Why? We're all a product of how we were raised. And in our society with so many dysfunctional families and so many crazy parents, there are sick people running around this country you can't even believe. Kids that were raised with no discipline. Kids who were raised with social media. Where are they now? BLM, Antifa, Palestinian riots. Harvard. See, back in the day when kids were disciplined, you know, they grew up differently than people that got timeouts. You're getting a timeout. Go to your room. I'm happy to. They've got every high tech thing you can imagine in their room. So they're having a timeout and it's party time. So it's time to get on a little porn. And, ah. When you don't discipline your kid, you're planting a seed of cancer in his soul. And they will end up pregnant, drunk, on drugs, in jail, and dropping out of school. They will live lives of failure. And Paul went on to explain that your Heavenly Father disciplines his children. Oh, now, wait a minute. Can't we just go back to the Bible study? No. Some of the things that bad that have happened in your life, God allowed it to happen because you needed discipline. And he is not a permissive parent. Born again Christians who have low IQs, and they're kind of dumb, a lot of times don't learn anything unless somebody hits them over the head with a board then they get it. Talking to them 
reasoning with them, using the word of God, sometimes doesn't work. And so God allows certain things to happen to you to snap you out of it. Your Heavenly Father is not a permissive parent. And if you keep going the direction you're going, sooner or later, somebody's going to drop a piano on you. Something's going to happen. Why? Because you're very loved. The daughter-in-law was pregnant, right? Phineas's wife. When this happened, remember? Yeah. When she heard the ark of God was taken and her father-in-law and Eli and her husband, Phineas, they were dead. Yeah. She goes into premature labor. Remember? And it's a bad labor and a bad delivery. And it's killing her. Well, the uh, nurse's aide that's working with her delivers the son and says to her, hey, I got some good news for you. You've got a son. And back in the day, everybody loved having sons more than daughters. No offense. That's how it was then. And she couldn't have cared less. Who's at fault for that baby's birth? Who's at fault for her dead? Eli wouldn't discipline his sons. And God let it go this far. And it had to be stopped. In the counseling business, we call it working with addicts. Hitting a bottom. I want to go into rehab. Have you have they hit a bottom yet? No. Well, let's hold off on rehab. They're gonna relapse for sure. Yeah. Hitting a bottom, you know what that is. Of course you do. God will allow his children sometimes to seem like they're hitting a bottom in an attempt to save them. Because they're not listening. They think they're privileged. It's okay, I can take these drugs, drink that, and pop some porn, and go here and go there. I'm fine. Grace covers it. Yeah, it does cover it until it doesn't. Then, in love, Something has to happen to you. When the prophet came to Eli, wouldn't you and me have been reacted the same way? That would have been a holy shoot moment, wouldn't it? Wouldn't you and I have run after those two imbeciles? Or using him, waddled after him. He weighed 400 pounds. You're not going to be running, but you're going to be moving. If you lean forward, you'll move quicker. I would have run them kids down and beat them within an inch of their lives. Would you have? Oh, I wouldn't need a, any more pushes for that. Hey, I got to stop this. Everybody in my family tree is going to die. That would have been enough motivation for me to do it. Not Eli. What did he do? Ordered another pizza.
She named the child Ichabod. In glory, it means inglorious. It means glory has departed. Departing glory. That's my son's name. Then she dies. Who's at fault for Ichabod having to be adopted out and not having a family? No parent, no mom, no dad. Eli was at fault. Who was at fault for the ark of God being taken? Eli. And there's Eli's legacy. He could have been fantastic. He was, a, up till this point, a fantastic man of God. He only had one weakness. He had a soft spot for his kids. If you have a soft spot for your kids to the point that you allow them to violate the law of God, you are helping to kill them. You are destroying their lives by loving them too much. He caused all these horrible things. Because he wouldn't discipline his children. Well, this doesn't always apply to bad parents, does it? Sometimes good parents get in trouble, right? Anybody ever heard of this dude? Oh, this is interesting. Very interesting. Judges chapter 13. Jehovah came to his mother. She was barren, like Sarah. And he said, listen, you're going to have a son. I'm going to give you a son. He's going to be mighty and powerful, the judge of Israel. Now, there are conditions. He tells the mother and the dad. Hair, no. No haircuts. He's dedicated as a Nazarite from the time he's born. You dedicate him to me. He's mine. Don't touch his hair, and he will begin the delivery out of the Philistines. Wouldn't it be great if Israel had somebody like that now? They don't have that now. The woman bore a son named him Samson. The Lord blessed Samson. The Spirit of God began to move on him when he was young. Judges 13. Samson went down to Timnah. He saw a woman of the daughter of Philistines. What happened to Samson? Well, <laughs> lust demons took this guy. You can see how it can happen. Could happen, couldn't you? Uh, this guy was the biggest deal anybody had ever seen. You know, he was like, what, Bo Jackson or something? And, uh, People who have lust demons, particularly men, are very visually oriented people. They have lust scanners in their eyes. I used to have one when I lived in sin, and I would scan a woman's body like you wouldn't believe. I watched everything. I noticed everything on my happy hour. My head spun around like Linda Blair in the Exorcist movie. <laughs> I was watching chicks like you wouldn't believe. On second thought, you would. Well, Samson had it much worse than me. Samson was a sex addict. And he sees a hot babe. And in the culture back then, Philistine women were bootalicious. Jewish women were not. They had clothing restrictions and behavioral restrictions. Philistine. Philistine women did not have that, see? They wore hot-looking outfits, jewelry, perfume. They were, they worked at the club. Yeah. The Jewish women didn't do the club or pole dancing. But the Philistine women, they were hot babes. And anybody with, a, with lust demons, naturally is going to gravitate toward the visually more sensuous female, correct? 
this is too deep for this group? This is a little too deep, right? I'm getting too much into the psychiatry. One over there. Did okay. Okay. I'll tone it down. He saw a hot babe of the Philistines. He went to his mom and dad. He said, I've seen, seen some booty. They had a lot of booty in Timna. Yeah, I read that in the correspondence. Of course. Okay. Go get her for me. Yeah. Hey, Samson, listen, uh, you don't seem to be the brightest guy in the neighborhood. Not the, not the sharpest knife in the light bulb box. Do uh, you think you want to get, a, get to know somebody first before you marry them? Do you think you want to kind of check them out? What about their faith beliefs? What about their religion? What about their habit? Do you want to get, get to know somebody before you marry them? Samson? No, not with this around. Uh-uh. No, we got hormones and that. No, we don't need that. I saw her. Go get her for me. Okay? This is the level of stupidity we're looking at here. And his father and mother said, listen, Samson, dude, son, these women here, they worship Jehovah. They're, they're good women. They're, they're not adulterers. They're not whores. They're not prostitutes. They're, they're faithful women. Why can't you fall in love or marry some woman that has the same faith you have, the same attitude you have that fits in with our family. What about, we're the in-laws. What, what are we going to do with some bootalicious Philistine hussy? What, what about, uh, what? they're reasoning with him. This, I'm adding to the conversation because this wasn't the, this was on the ice, tip of the iceberg. They had a long talk with si Samson numerous times. You know, snap, do, son, snap out of this thing. You... <laughs> Ooh, is, is that, is that bad? Son, knock it off. Okay, here you have good parents that tr raised him right, and they're trying to discipline their son. The other parents we looked at went the opposite direction. They didn't discipline. Now we got good parents who are trying to discipline their son, but somebody who has a sex addiction can't be disciplined. Hello? Samson said, thanks for the advice, Mom. Shut up, Dad. Go get her for me. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Nice move there. She pleases me. Yashar ayayin. What does that mean? I like her looks. Why, she had on a Philistine hot outfit. She had special, they had Philistine thongs back then. <laughs> they were fabulous. -o. Then they had lace and they had jewelry and they sprayed stuff on them some of the jewish women they were good loving hard-working women but to be honest you know they kind of felt smelled like somebody working in the field but these philistinian women they were hot babes and they their bodies were important to them they showed it off hey hey she looks great to me go get her that one well you know the story right she betrayed him he, he, he told them a riddle, and she, she told him what it was. She, she stabbed him in the back. What'd you expect? What'd you expect? She's worshiping false gods. She's not Jewish. She doesn't care about Jehovah. What, what, do, you, what do you expect's going to happen? But when you're a sex addict with a low IQ, you're pulled around in life by demons. You have no control over your life. Well, after that disaster, he got rid of her, right? He goes in Judges 16, and, you know, what's he do there? I, he does, I, once again, what, if you're a sex addict or you're addicted to something, alcohol, drugs, whatever it is, food, you don't think rationally. Your body is pushed by spirits to do things you don't want to do. There are compulsions and urges in your body. You can't control. So he's in the mood for sex. He goes into a zana, prostitute. And it came to pass, Judges 16, 
he falls in love again. Guess who that one was? Another Philistine woman. This one was, this one was a top of the line escort. Top of the line, you know. Kind of like the ones they got in New York where they charge, what, 500 bucks an hour or something like that. This was a top-notch escort, Philistine woman, Delilah. She was super hot. <laughs> she started, he starts dating her, and he falls in love with her, and the Philistines notice it, and so they say, hey, here's our advantage. The other wife, we set her up to get the riddle solved, right? We won that one. She betrayed him. He, now he's with Delilah. Hey, and the Philistines are thinking, hey, this moron never learns. He doesn't get it. He can't control himself. Samson's out of control. Wow. The number one man of God in Israel is out of control and a sex addict. What could go wrong? So they set him up. They want to kill him. And we, there were five lords that visit her, we will make you independently wealthy. We'll each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. That's 550 pieces. She was set for life. She agrees to take the bribe, and she starts to ply Samson, and... Uh, he doesn't want to tell her, right? So he makes up a story, right? Yeah, so it's like a, today, if you're married, you know. If you're due home at 8 and you show up at 11, you, hear, you open the door and you hear a voice in the back of the house. Where were you? And right there, you got to make something up. You can't tell them where you were. I did that years ago. I was pretty good at coming up with something right off the cuff. It's always some charitable cause. Hey, listen, you haven't told me. You lied to me. You mocked me three times. You told me this story. That's where your strength came from. You told me that story. That's where your strength came from. And he's still there. Okay. The first time he... She asked him what the secret of his strength was. I would have been out of there so fast. He wouldn't have, the first time. First time. Okay. Unless I was a sex addict and was dating a sex goddess, okay, then I'd be in trouble. Samson was in trouble. He wasn't going to leave. It came to pass, she pressed him. Daily with her words, nagging him to death, urging him, pushing him. He had thoughts of suicide. It was so bad. Then, what happens? He cracks. Judges 16, 17, he tells her what the secret of it is. He had seven locks on his head, seven interesting numbers, and they'd never been cut. He was a Nazarite from his mother's womb. If you cut them or shave them off, he says, my strength will be gone. He actually tells her. Yeah, this, is, this, is after, this is after he knew she was trying to betray him. He knew it. People who are addicted to things don't use any rational common sense, right? You weigh 290 pounds and you just ordered a pizza. That isn't a rational decision. That's lust demons pushing you to do things with your body you don't want to do. Well, I've been clean and sober for two weeks now. I can just have one drink. Oh, What's that? The beginning of a relapse. 
People with lust demons don't think straight. They do things they know is wrong, just like Samson. Delilah noticed that he finally told her the truth. She could sense it. And what did she do to him? 5,500 5, pieces of silver. She immediately betrays him and tells him to come get him. They brought the money. Delilah was not a sex addict. She was covetous. Her God was money. Different demon, same result. After they had sex, he passes out. He's sleeping on her knees. She calls for a man, and they cut his locks off. While he's asleep, he doesn't even feel it. He doesn't know it's happening. People with addictions think they can just keep going and going and going, and there's no day of reckoning. Nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to get caught. Ow. What happened to Samson? She starts to verbally evict him, afflict him, and attack him. Anna. She yells at him just like the other times. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. He says, I'll just wake up and shake myself. I'll be fine. But he did not know the Lord had departed from him. Wow. <clears throat> he didn't know. Why? People with addictions don't know things. They live by feelings. They live by emotions. They live by the lusts of their flesh. They don't see the end coming. Well, you know the rest of the story. It was a bad one. They ground his eyes out. He was blind. Took him back to the, the temple and he was grinding in the prison house. What happened to Samson here? Well, the first time she asked him where that power came from, he made up the story about vines. He said, if you tie me up with new vines that nobody's ever touched before, I won't be able to get out of them. She yells at him, hey, the Philistines are here. Boom, he breaks them. He tells her another story. She gripes and moans. He says, hey, oh, it's not the vines, it's ropes. <laughs> you know, if you tie me up with brand new ropes that nobody else has ever been tied up with, I'll, I'll be as weak as a kitten. Samson, the Philistine, boom! Gone. What was the third one? He said, if you braid my hair a certain way, and put a pen in it, I'll be as weak as a kitten. She does it. Samson, no problem. Notice how Samson, like modern Christians today, gradually seep toward they get a little, they sin a little bit here, and then they stop. Well, I can't do that. Then they sin a little more there. No, I can't, I can't. No, I got to, well, let me sin just a little bit more. He gradually got to his, a lie about his hair. The fourth time was 
the truth about his hair. He slowly, through sin, through stupidity, through lack of discipline, for not listening to his parents, for thinking he had all the answers, for assuming the grace of God would cover him under all, any and all circumstances, he ends up dead. Once you start down sin, slippery slope, it speeds up as you get down the slope. It starts out a little slower, and then it speeds. Once the snowball comes down, it gets bigger and faster. As soon as he told her the hair story, he told her the rest of the hair story. Sex addiction is something that the most intelligent people in the world can't control. These two guys here, famous sex addicts, extremely, <laughs> extremely intelligent people. Oh, there they are. More sex addicts. These sex addicts ended up in prison. Sex addiction makes no sense. Lust demons make no sense. Being addicted to something makes no sense whatsoever. All these men here could have had all kinds of women. They could have paid for whatever they wanted. They could have got top-notch women at an escort service. Bill Cosby could have had any woman he wanted. What the demons teach him? Hey, you, you want to have total control over these women, right? You want to, you're a control freak. Well, to have total control of somebody, if you, the only way to do that is to drug them. And then you do whatever you want with them. There he is. Guy weighs four something pounds, 400 pounds, right? You know the story, right? He weighs 400 something pounds. He finally says, you know, I got to go on a diet. I can't, I can't spend the rest of my life like this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to eat Subway. I'm going to eat at Subway permanently. I'm going to eat at Subway all the time. He starts eating at Subway. That's all he eats. Remember? He loses 280 pounds or something. Well, the school newspaper at college gets wind of the story, and they, they write an article on him. Hey, the, this guy's on the Subway diet. He's famous. Somebody working at Subway sees the article, sends it to the home office, what happens next? Yeah, the guy ends up, the national spokesman for Subway, ends up a multi-millionaire, filthy rich. Subway doesn't bother to investigate the guy's background at all. They, all they care about is the story about this gigantic guy losing all this weight, eating sub sandwiches at Subway. That's all they care about. He's a good-looking guy. He's friendly. Hey, this is a fantastic marketing opportunity, and it was. Subway ended up with more stores in the United States than McDonald's because of this guy. I mean, it swept the country until it didn't anymore. You know, what happened there? Oh, you know, if you make somebody your national spokesman, you might want to investigate them to find out if they're a pervert. Think that's a good idea? Oh, well, think about, I'll, I'll get back to that. Come to find out the guy is a, it's a pedophile. His computer is loaded with kiddie porn. He's been sleeping with teenage girls, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old girls for years and never got caught. He was a sex addict. 
like Samson. Even weighed more than Samson. What happened to him? Prison. Were you were you raised by permissive parents? Anybody here? Did you have a hard life? I bet you did. Proverbs chapter 22 foolishness is bound in the heart of a child Why it's natural children don't have the knowledge or the experience to navigate in the real world You're their parent you're being you've been given Parenthood responsibilities by God and you're supposed to nurture and train that child up in the way of the Lord You're supposed to help them show them direct them train them Right, that's what you're supposed. That's what God gave a parent for. And if you leave a child alone, they're going to live a foolish life. Discipline will drive foolishness far from you. Apply your heart to instruction and your ears to the words of knowledge. Proverbs twenty-three. And do not withhold correction from your child. If you beat him with a rod, he will not die. What's he saying there? Don't be like Aaron and Eli and be a permissive parent and see your kids end up dead. Don't see them become an addict and OD. You shall beat them with a rod and shall deliver their soul from hell. Wow, what a statement that is. My son, if your heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice. Yes, my reign shall rejoice when your lips speak right things. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> As I've been a counselor for over 40 years. You wouldn't believe the depression of mothers who come to see me or parents that come to see me whose child is out of control. You can't even imagine the sorrow these people are living with. Why? Because they love this child so much, it's killing them to see what's happening to them. Well, what was the problem? Here it is. Proverbs 29, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to themselves brings their mothers to shame. Wow, no kidding. I've had mothers and sitting in my office in tears over their kids. Drugs, jail, prison, homeless, living on the streets. It's a catastrophe. Why? No discipline. Years ago, when I was living in sin, I was a bad parent. I was a workaholic, and my two daughters, I was hardly home. And after I got divorced, I would see them on the weekends. They would spend the night with me. And my, young, my oldest daughter was always very respectful of me, but my youngest daughter. She got involved with peer pressure at school. She started to she started to swear And We were out at dinner one one night and she said a curse word damn this thing or something and I said hey honey look uh, If you want to swear you you swear at home Don't don't when it when you come over and spend the weekend with your dad. I don't want you swearing over here She was in like seventh grade or something, you know and she started cursing around me. So I told her. And the next weekend I had to tell her again. Did it again. You know, and the next weekend we went to an ASU baseball game. Now I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just sharing a story about what I did when I was living in sin. Okay, I'm not I'm not telling you to do this. this a, I'm not recommending any of this. We go to the ASU baseball game. They're playing USC. 
And we're sitting up at the top of the bleachers on the left third baseline, way at the top, the last seat at the top. And behind us is one rail, this rail and that rail. And we were sitting up against these rails. That was it. It was just two crew rails. And then down there was, you know, like a 30-foot drop onto the pavement. And somebody on ASU bungles the play. And I go, oh. And my oldest daughter goes, oh, no. And my youngest daughter goes, yells out, damn it. And I go, without even turning a hair, went like this, whack, right across the mouth. She falls back off the chair, grabs the rail, fearing for her life. I go on talking like nothing happened. Literally nothing happened. I didn't even react to it. She almost fell to her death. I wasn't even looking. Oh, I wish you would have caught that. Tara, what happened? I didn't even, didn't even acknowledge it. She sat there shivering the rest of the game. We lost. To this day, my daughter has never sworn around me again. Almost 40 years later, not once has she ever sworn around me. Oh, Brother Mike, you're Dr. Spock. No, I'm not telling you to do that. If you're in a stadium, death is right there. I'm not telling you to slap your kid and knock I'm just telling you what happened. I'm just sharing what happened. That's all. Not recommending it. Well, I don't know, a year and a half later, my daughter got around some kids at school, same daughter, and she's back talking. No matter what I say, she sasses me back. She thinks she's the cock of the roost. She thinks she's the biggest deal in the world. And I, I told her, hey, look, listen, honey, you're, you're sassing me. I know you do that with your mother, but that's between you and your mother. You, you can't come over to my house here and, and sass me, talk back to me, talk to me like I'm an idiot. You can't do that. Okay, you need to stop that. Well, the next weekend they come by, she doesn't stop it. <clears throat> she does it again. I said, hey, honey, come on now. We talked about it last. Don't sass me back like that. Forget about it, Dad. You know, shut up, Dad. You know, sassy. I said, listen, that can't, we can't do that. I can't, that's going to ruin our time together. I said that you don't talk to your dad like that. If you're, you talk to your mother like that, that's, that's your business with her. Okay, I'm not involved in that. Well, she did it again, and I called her mother. And I said to the mother, Hey, you know, uh, she's been sassing me, talking back to me. And uh, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to crack her. And uh, I don't mean she's, a, I don't mean she was a cracker. I mean, you know, well, technically she is a cracker, and she white. But anyway, I said to her mother, and of course, anything I said to her mother. She disagreed with. It didn't matter if I said the sky was blue. No, it's not blue. It's, it's, it's tin and green. You know. She said, well, you better not do it. Yeah, listen, I can't. It's, this is getting out of hand. I got to do something. And I had never spanked this daughter, ever. I spanked the other daughter once when she was little. That was it. I wasn't a spanker. That wasn't my style. And I says to her, look, I'm going I'm to have to break her. Something's got to be done. This can't con continue to go up. Well, they come over next weekend. And it's time to go. I got to get them in the truck, and we got to go. Time for me to take them back home. It was uh, Sunday night. And she starts up. She starts sassing me. 
dad this and dad that. Never said a word. Went upstairs. Came downstairs. Doubled the belt over. Like this. Walked up to her. Crack! Right across her back. Like a horse. Never said a word. Didn't react. Nothing. She looks at me angry. And I thought, oh, God. And right inside, inside, I'm dying. I am sick to my stomach. I'm not a spanker. I'm dying. But I'm not going to let on. See? At that moment, I turned into Robert De Niro. <laughs> Academy Award performance. She looks at me with anger. Coming over the shoulder, down the back. Bang! Like a horse. Then a look of shock came over her face. Well, I don't have to do... Third time. Crack! She starts crying. And she yells, okay, and runs out and gets in the truck. I come back out the truck like nothing happened. Hi, Tara. Did you enjoy your weekend? I start talking. You know. I get a call. Guess who I got a call from? Just take a wild guess, okay? Oh, yeah. The warden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for adding to the teaching. I get a call from the big boss, the god mother in this case the runner of the the gang did you beat Tracy up I said no I didn't beat her up I said here's what happened she wouldn't I told you I was going to have to do something this thing was getting out of hand she's treating me like I'm one of her idiots friends at school I can't have that she's ruining my weekends with my kids I had to do something I didn't know what else to do you know well, that did it. She's never going to talk to you again. I said, well, I don't know about that, but I, the only thing I knew was I could not continue with that behavior. I, could, I couldn't take it. It was too much for me. It was too much. It was ruining everything. I call back over there the next weekend. She answers the phone. I had been working out with her. I used to be a tennis player, tournament tennis player. And I was teaching her tennis because she was on the tennis team in high school. You know, she answers the phone. I said, hi, 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 Tracy. Hi, Dad. I thought, well, she kind of sounds glad to hear, hear from me. What is happening there? Yeah, Dad, guess what happened to me? I, I'm, I'm 8-0 at the, in the tournament. I went this and that, and I was hitting serves and this. I said, you know, I said, oh, my God, I can't believe this. Well, that's wonderful, honey, and I start pouring on encouragement. I'm happy, and I'm thrilled. She never sassed me again. My other daughter, Witnessing the carnage <laughs> never sassed me to this day, and she's 46 years old. <laughs> 46. Never sassed me. I was, she was laughing about it one day at, a, at dinner out. She says to me, my oldest daughter, not the one that I beat up, she says, Dad, uh, we're going to pay you back when you're old and in the rest home. I said, you are? Okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hobble over to the closet and grab my cane, and I'm going to come out swinging. 
That's right. Yeah. The pens and all. If I'm going down, somebody's going with me. I told you that story to tell you this. That I'm not telling you to do any, any of those things that I did. I was living in sin. I didn't know what I was doing. I was desperate to fix a situation that was getting out of hand for me. But the point that God is telling us here is if you don't discipline your children, you're going to destroy them. And it's going to be your fault. God pointed the finger at Eli, not the two sons. Moses pointing the finger at Aaron. Not the two sons. If you do not discipline your children, they will grow up without discipline. What does that mean? Drugs, unwanted pregnancies, sexual promiscuity, Addictions to alcohol, overdoses, jail time, prison time, mental illnesses, clinical depression, bipolar. And then you will suffer the rest of your life. Why? Because someone you love is self destructing and you had a chance to save them and didn't let's pray